I'm not long-winded. I try to tell my congregation uh, less is more, and uh, I'll go with that. I, I find it fitting that uh, the worship team in their lineup, they sang the song, uh, Our Bones Sing, and that, that's this morning's text. I'll be speaking out of Ezekiel. But this morning, I want to share a little story. And it was a story about a man and a wife, and a man was reading his paper early one morning, and at the breakfast table, his wife came over to him and, and gave him a big old hug and smiled and says, I bet you know what today is. Do you? And he looked at her and says, of course I know what today is. But, of course, he was kind of scared because he knew how sensitive his wife was about special occasions. So as he was trying to put that, his thoughts together, he said, is it her birthday? And he said, I don't know if it's her birthday. Maybe it's her birthday. So after he got to work and he called a florist and had a bouquet of white roses sent to his wife. And then as the day progressed, he got really concerned and he worried. And he says, maybe the flowers aren't enough for such an important day. Maybe it's their anniversary, he said to himself. So he went to the jewelry store down to his office from his office and picked out a beautiful gold necklace and had it special delivered to his wife. As he started home from work, he decided maybe he should also stop by and buy an expensive box of chocolates because his wife loved chocolates and bring it to her just in case. Then he pulls into a driveway and his wife runs out to greet him. And as he gets out of the car and presents her with a box of chocolates, she throws her arms around him and says, oh, honey, this is the best Groundhog's Day I ever had. <laughs> I thought it was funny myself. <laughs> anyway, I, I think about that, and it reminds you, husbands, you got to know t three dates. Her, her birthday, your anniversary, and just because. <laughs> just because takes place any day of the year. And that's why I usually tell guys Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day was just instituted for husbands to, to remind them to do something special for your loved one. But if you do this on a regular basis, then Valentine's Day is just a, another day to you. Oh, you didn't get that. This morning, this morning, when we think of the, the prophet, is, um, we, we come to the, the historic account. I, I got to kind of put you there because when you think of the prophet is, uh, Ezekiel, it's kind of hard to grab hold of this. We just sang a, a beautiful rendering of a song of dry bones that come to life. But in the, in the book of Ezekiel, this was a vision that came to Israel under their captivity in Babylon. We know that the, the kingdom split. And because the kingdom split, God spoke, and it was a revelation on the, the condition of God's people because of there were different things. Both kings at that time were, did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and because of the split, God promised a restoration to the people of God at that time. But when we think about Ezekiel and how he speaks spiritually to the people, we know that spiritually they were dry, and they have become complacent. And we also know that God promised that he would restore his people. Now, I've been asking myself as I was thinking about the prophet Ezekiel, and I, th I usually think about the, the text, and when I think about the text, I says, what does New Life Christian Fellowship have to do with dry bones? And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of being facetious because I'm thinking, Lord, I know this church. I don't think this church needs to be revived in that, this manner. At least I don't think so, but I don't know your hearts. I could only say, God, is this the message you want me to bring to New Life Christian Fellowship? Are they dry? Are they a heap of bones? Are they dead? Are they lifeless? But I believe God is reminding us this morning when we think about the prophet Ezekiel and everything that was re revealed to him. Today could be that warning. Today could be that warning to remind this church that if you allow yourself even in the event of everything God has shown favor on your individual lives, because with every individual, whether it be ministers, 
It could be ministry leaders. It could be individual people. If God is showing favor on your life, you can grow complacent. You can grow spiritually to a point where you are now just coming to church and taking up one of these blue chairs. Because things get like that. When things are going good, that's the time we less recognize who God is in our lives. When things are going good, it's hard to praise God. But when things are going awry, when you're going through trials, when you're facing giants, that's when you are closer to God. Amen? Amen. That's when you kind of draw near to God because you have nowhere else to turn. And this is a reminder to us, and it's a warning to us when we think of the book of Ezekiel, that when we are a church, we want God to continue to show his favor upon the work that is being done here, that he will prosper the ministry here, that he will anoint the ministers here, that the word of God that is proclaimed from this pulpit always finds a resting place in the hearts of people that come here. Amen? Amen. So we think about the, the book of Ezekiel, and I'll be reading uh, verse, uh, chapter 37, verses 1 through 4. Now, again, I don't know, I, I don't want to make the assumption that everybody has read the book of Ezekiel or, for, any, for that matter, any of the gospel. So we're going to do a little reading this morning. Is that okay? Right. Nobody is nobody's saying, oh, okay. <laughs> I, any, if anybody can shake your head like this? Okay, we're going to do some reading. Okay, it says this, that the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out into the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. Then I, he caused me to pass by them all, all around. And behold, there were very many in open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus say the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you. And you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as, as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them. Over, uh, them over, and there was no breath in them. Also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man, and say to the breath, thus say the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on the slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and, breathed, and breath came upon them, and they lived, and they stood up on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus say the Lord God, behold my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into a land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O oh my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the, the text at hand, Lord. I pray, Lord Jesus, that the people of God here at New Life Christian Fellowship, Lord, that you will awaken them this morning, Lord. Awaken them to the point, Lord Jesus, that this is a warning. This is a reminder. Even though we're in celebration mode, 25 years, it's a reminder to the people, Lord, that, yes, we have reached a pinnacle time in the ministry. Yes, Lord Jesus, your favor has been upon them. But it's a warning, Lord Jesus, to wake up and let them know, Lord Jesus, that these things, this spiritual dryness could befall on them if they allow 
spiritual dryness to come upon them. And it begins with individuals, Lord. So I pray right now as you hide me behind your precious cross, impart your truths to your people, remind them, Lord Jesus, of your greatness and your glory. Let them know, Lord Jesus, that this can continue in the lives of your people from glory to glory to glory. In the precious name of Jesus, and everybody says, amen. God bless you. Got three points this morning. And my first point this morning is when things start rattling, God happens. When things start happening or things start rattling, God happens. And you know, I, when I was kind of having fun with this, there are certain words that usually come off the page. And when they come off the page, I like to believe that's God. They call that Rima. I, I believe God is speaking to me. And there's so much in this, this one verse but usually God speaks to me in a matter of simplicity. He speaks to me in a, in a way that reminds me as an individual that it's in the simplest things that God speaks. And God says in verse 7, he says, suddenly a rattling took place. And, I, and I'm reminding you that how many of you believe that God, when there is a shaking going on in your life, God is trying to grab your attention? Let me say that again. When there is shaking or rattling going on in your own individual life, God is trying to grab your attention. And God is in the business of this. God is usually reminding us as he commanded through his spoken word, God is trying to tell some of you that when I rattle your life, like I said, when things are going well in your life, it's always seeming like it's great. In fact, when things are going well, it's easy to follow the worship team in praise and worship. But when your life is in disarray, when you're going through certain trials, when you're suffering because you're facing various giants in your life, it is hard to feel the excitement and the praise of the worship team and be led because all you're thinking about is what you're facing and all you see. But God needs to shake you up. God needs to allow the rattling in your life to remind you that he's still sovereign, that he's still in control. And even though you're thinking, wow, everybody's having a great time, they're clapping their hands, they're raising their hands, they're, they're dancing in the aisles, and people are just having so much fun, but they don't know what I'm going through right now. I'm struggling right now. I'm hurting. And they don't know that I have a difficult time just to even raise my hand in praise, but God is reminding some of us that he does this in your life because he's grabbing your attention, amen? amen? God is in the business of rattling and shaking things up because God, when God rattles things, God happens, amen? It took place in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. It says, and when they had prayed, they were in the upper room. The place where they were assembled together was shaken. And when you think about God, we know what took place in the upper room. And when things start to tremble, when things start to shake, God happens. Amen. I don't know if there's been an upper room experience here at, at New Life in a long time, but I'm here to tell you, we don't really like to talk about denomination. We're always talking more about God, but because we're Pentecostal, we need to be people and I'm reminded of this. Let me share a little story with you. I got the privilege to speak at Santa Monica's church in Los Angeles. And this church that they occupy, in the front of their church, it said, Santa Monica Pentecostal Church. Beautiful sign. I mean, they must have spent thousands on that sign. But I walked into the sanctuary, and they had worship service. I looked around, and I said, everybody's hand. I thought I was an Episcopal church. I saw everybody, and they were just singing, you know, naturally just singing. And then I looked around. There was no movement. There was no real praise. I mean, I'm not, maybe I shouldn't be judging people because people worship in their own manner. But I'm thinking, God thought of you when he said, who am I that God is mindful of me? In other words, my life was significant to God that he was willing to go to the cross for me. And if he was willing to go to the cross 
on my behalf, even if I was the only person on earth, and we are Pentecostal by denomination, and you have a sign out there that even markets your church as Pentecostal, and not one of you can raise your hand in victory, that's false advertising. It's a reminder to me that in the church of God, you know, again, I don't even really promote my denomination. I promote Jesus, amen? But I'm reminding us that I know and we know, amen? We know who Jesus is. We know what he's done for us. We know what he continues to do in us. We know how he does for us, amen? That's how much we know God. And because we know God, raising my hands in victory and praise to the King of kings and the Lord of lords is not a hard thing to do. Some of us have a hard time with that because you, we have this attitude, and when we think about this attitude, God reminds us that that's why you need to be, sh something needs to take place in your life. God is shaking you up to remind you it's not about you. It's never been about you. You, when you gave your life to Jesus, you entered his story. <laughs> Let me get that again. When you entered into his life, you entered into his story. I love when worship teams, I call them cheerleading teams. I love when they come up here and it, you know what? I used to lead worship back in the day. I used to do that. And you know what? You have to have a lot of, a lot of Starbucks to come up here. And some of you don't know what it is to lead worship. But if you've never had a, a chance to lead worship, you know it takes a lot of energy to come out here to look into the faces of these people. And there's, there might have been things that were going on that morning for them as they drove to church. Maybe they're not in worship mode, even though our lives are supposed to be living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. So you know as they're coming to church, you're praying that they are already purpose or intently coming to church with an attitude of worship. But as a worship leader, as you gaze into the eyes of people and you look at them, why is it so hard to get them to enter into the courts of praise? Why is it so hard? I mean, it's almost like I was expecting them to come out and run out here. Come on, guys. Come on. Let's do something. I mean, if we have to be, oh, yeah, you're right. Let's give God this much. We have problems, but we need to be reminded that's why God shakes things up, amen? It also said in, verse, uh, in chapter 16 of the same uh, book, Acts, it says, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosened. God shakes things up maybe in your lives right now. You need to come loose. You may be involved in relationships. You may be involved with something that is going on in your life that God is frowning upon. In fact, God is trying to tell you you need to leave that relationship. Maybe you're involved in something. Maybe you're involved in a ministry that's literally dry. And God is trying to shake things up in your life because you need to tell your pastor, this is not going to happen. I need to do something different. But God reminds us that when these chains, when we think of, you know, that, what's that song? No more shackles, no more. That doesn't just mean sin. It means everything else that could be hindering you from receiving the favor of God. Amen. And when God shakes up your life, he's trying to do something incredible in your life. Amen. Am I messing things up by walking around? No. Okay, didn't say anything to me. One more, Matthew 20, uh, 27, 51. I love this one. This is my favorite about shaking. It says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks split. This was God. This was God giving accessibility because back in the ancient days, it took a priest, a high priest, to go behind the holies of holies. In fact, those that are behind that door, you guys are in the, in the outer courts. This right here, you're the inner courts. You're privileged. Amen. But everything behind here 
is considered the holies of holies, and there's supposed to be a big old curtain, if you will, thick, where nobody can go behind there except for Pastor Phil. And if you think about that, that was torn, so God allowed you to go and have access to him personally. And that's why when we glory in God, when God shakes things up, God is reminding us God happens. And he allows us to have total access to him. Amen? It's an exciting thing. You mean to tell me that I could talk to God anytime I want? Yes. Anytime I want? Yes. Anytime you want, you could talk to God. I usually uh, say this to the church, and I, I'm reminded as a pastor. I could ask Pastor Phil to stand up here, and can, I could ask him, do you know where everybody's spiritual walk is at a given moment? And, of course, he could tell me no. But let's just say, and I, I've said this to my own congregation, what if Pastor Phil were to say this? In the beginning of every service, instead of the worship leader opening up an invocation, basically opening up in prayer, that he randomly picked every one of you. So he said, no, I'm not telling you he's going to do that. Everybody's getting scared. Okay, let's say he did. So, like, starting next Sunday, he says, and he points and he, by you, and he goes, oh, brother so-and-so, would you open us up in a word of prayer and of which you can either come up here or you can pray where you are? And then at the end of the service, sister so-and-so, can you close the service? Pastor Phil would be able to use that as a measuring tool to where your relationship with God is. Because if you're one of those individuals that has a casual, superficial relationship with God, then your prayer is short and sweet. But if you love God, in fact, if you love God so much, if we were going to have blessings for the meal afterwards, we would not choose you. Because you would be long-winded. You would pray, and you would pray heaven down. And all of us would say, what is that, a six-point prayer? But that's a good thing. It's a reminder that you have a relationship with the Almighty God, that you are God's favorite, and that's the way you look at God. So if anybody asked you to pray, you didn't ask me to pray. Yes, I did. They know the type of prayer life and the relationship you have with God. But if you're an individual that struggles with praying and talking to God, then pastor would know that he has some work to do in your life. Because there are a lot of us that struggle with just bowing our heads before our meal. And God reminds us that this is the most significant part of the communion that you have with God. And maybe that's why God is trying to shake up your life because he says, I miss my time with you. God wants to talk to you. And the way you talk to God is to put away your cell phone, put away the television, put away all those distractions, and find that secret place and say, God, I'm yours right now. Can we talk? Amen? Amen? My second point this morning is it's a we thing. So we go from when things start rattling, God happens to it's a we thing. You say, where does we thing? Well, I could have changed that and said it's a church thing because it's about 25 years. 25 years is epic. 25 years is enormous. 25 years is gigantic. I mean, it's a, it's a time where the church comes together, and verse 10 says, so I prophesied as he commanded me. This is the prophet Ezekiel listening to God. And he says, and breath came into them. Did you hear that? It didn't say that breath came into me. It says breath came into them. And then it says, and they lived. And then it says, and they stood up on their feet. And of course, at the end, it says, and they were an exceedingly great army. It's a we thing. It's a church thing. And when God does a work, God is trying to do a tremendous thing in your life. Brother Mark kind of was stealing my illustration. He was stealing my illustration because I was thinking, Lord, when you think about a we thing, a church thing, it's always about the church. And I was excited when Pastor Phil said, 
at the convention that was coming a year ago. He goes, we'll host the next convention. And, of course, Stockton always does it. We're privileged. I want you to know the church, we're always privileged to host it. But you know what? That's an enormous, an enormous feat to put on a convention. And now that you have put on a convention, and now that you know what it takes to put on a convention, and I'm looking at my notes here, and I'm thinking, wow, to host a convention, what does that mean for New Life Christian Fellowship? That means Pastor Phil had to have a meeting, and meeting, and meeting, and meeting. And he had to gather the troops and all the lieutenants and captains and all the army and had to tell them, okay, how do we plan this? We get to host a convention. We don't have to host it, but we get to because God's going to bless. So he had to rally the troops. He had to rally an exceedingly great army. And when you put all hands on deck, and I'm thinking the women's ministry, the men's ministry, the youth breakthrough ministry, the little kids, everybody, all hands on deck. Because as brother was saying, this was seven, 24 hours, 24 seven, everybody was doing everything to get the house ready for God's people. I know you were busy. I mean, putting on a convention, it, it, it takes its toll on its people. In fact, for many of you, I didn't even see most of you during the convention, not because I was busy, because I like to at least talk to some of the people. And then on top of just putting on a convention, you tried to up the level of, of what it was to be a conventioneer and have that wonderful spread of, of food afterwards? Oh, you didn't get that. So you're thinking, this is the leadership here. The leadership, we got to put this on. You had to, to adorn the sanctuary with everything. You had to get it ready for sound. You had to get it ready just aesthetically and get it pretty because of God, who God is. This was the temple of God. Not here, even though this is, but you had to prep that warehouse so that as the people of God came, so everybody had to come together and do everything they were instructed to do. You had one main purpose and focus. Get ready for the convention. And I know it took a lot. Blood, sweat, and tears, and and people coming together, but God reminds us, whether it was older or younger, people with natural or spiritual gifts, people that were committed or faithful, but we were all empowered by the Holy Spirit, amen? Let me say that again. When you are God's people and an exceedingly great army, you are empowered with natural abilities as well as spiritual giftings, and God uses all those to be glorified in everything you do. Amen? It's a church thing. And when it's a church thing, that means you do enormously great things, not for yourself, because I don't think the men, when they put together everything that they put together, they didn't come back and say, that was us. And the women, as they were prepping everything, turned around and said, you know what? If it wasn't for us, it wouldn't have been successful. And then young people, when they did everything they did, if they, if they turned around and said, they looked at the venue and said, you know, at the end of it, everybody says they were so blessed. The young people want to say, it's all about what we did. It was a church thing. Everybody came together, young and old. And that's what, that's what these great events do for churches. It brings the body together. And, and I think about this, too. The prep is one thing, but to, when everybody left, anybody have big families that come and stay at your house, you know, for the holidays, right? You get the house all clean. Not that it's not clean now, but let's say you get everything clean, right? And they stay for the holidays. They stay for the weekend. When they finally leave and you look at your house and you go, we got a lot to clean up, right? <laughs> right? I mean, we got to clean it up. And, and the thing is, it's the same way with churches. As a pastor, I get more excited when the body of Christ comes together. And as they come together, we see them working, everybody working together, not a, as individual departments or individuals in themselves, but they come together working hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder, talking, 
communion and just coming together. And as a pastor to sit back and watch that, wow, to God be all the glory. Amen? It's a church thing. And that's what God intended from the very beginning to remind us it's always been a church thing. Working together, working hand in hand. And that's why if you get the privilege of doing it again, I'm not saying that pastor is going to raise his hands again because he's probably going to have to ask you for your permission, right? But let's say he does. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that if he ever does say, you know, we did such an incredible job that one year, I thought we could do it again. Yes. Yes. I, didn't, I only heard one amen because <laughs> everybody was saying, hey, somebody put the, her hand over her mouth. <laughs> But it's just a reminder to you, you know, unless you're willing to step out in faith, and I, I tell leadership this all the time, many of us in the body of Christ never understand or receive the favor or blessings of God because we're not willing to step out in faith. This church would not know it was a church thing unless you were willing to follow your leader. Let me say it again unless you were willing to follow your leader and then watch God moves in your lives as you put together a wonderful convention. Amen. And when you put on this great convention, because I don't know, if we all were on Facebook together, I'm here to tell you that when we left the convention, we would have blown up Facebook by everybody saying we had such an incredible time. It was such a blessing that New Life Christian Fellowship put together just a great event. So I usually say it was a convention to remember. Everybody's shaking their heads now, right? <laughs> Amen? Because it, it took the whole body coming together. Nobody was left out. In fact, the cleanup was probably even harder. And putting things back to the way you know that you, they have to go back. But still watching people come together is just a wonderful thing for the leadership because that's what it is. Amen. Amen. So we go from, from when things start rattling, God happens to, to it's a we thing to lastly, it's all about God. I know that seems real simple. And you're thinking, well, Pastor, it's always been about God. But verse 14 says this. This is commanded of God to the prophet Ezekiel. He says, and he's talking to this exceedingly great army, because the army is just dry bones. And he's reminding them, I still got to do my part. So as he's prophesying to these dry bones, and he, he even asks God, you know, he's kind of wondering, I don't know if, if this can mount to anything, God. And God asked him, can these dry bones live? And the prophet turns to God and says, only you know, God. And it's the same way do we as people of God, when we think about this phrase, it's all about God, do we place God in his rightful place in our lives? Don't answer that. That's a rhetorical question. Do we place God, if it's all about God, do we place God in his rightful place in our lives? Because it, we may be thinking, well, pastor, we're church people. That doesn't mean anything. If you're church people, I would assume that as the Bible tells us in chapter 6, verse 33, seek he first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But with people of God, we don't always place God in his rightful place in our lives. Sometimes our jobs are higher than God. Sometimes our wives' husbands are above God, and vice versa. Our husbands are above God. Sometimes our relationships, our children are above God. Let me even say this to those in ministry. Sometimes ministry is more an idol than God is. Sometimes it's the things that we do, the little peripheral things that we do in life. I mean, people know that I'm a passionate fanatic of certain sports teams, 
And people, you, you know, they ask me these crazy questions. I'm a pastor of a church. And they go, Pastor, do you have season tickets to the Raiders? <laughs> Let me drink something real quick. Yes, I'm very passionate. I bleed. And you know what? Thank you. I, I, you guys didn't have to adorn the church in silver and black. Yeah. You didn't have to. For me, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm just touched. You didn't have to do this for me. But you know what? I, I, I think about this and I go, wow, this is something amazing. That the people of God knowing that if God is really placed above all your relationships, everything that you do in this life, everything that you are in this life, if God is preeminent in your life, meaning first, that means everything else after God comes a very distant second. In fact, you shouldn't be able to see where second place is because God should be above everything else. And when you think about You know, this church, you're thinking, how do we mend? How do we merge two generations, young and old? I call it classics and techies. Because I don't like to say old and new. Because I'm one of the ones that are in the middle. Okay? (laughs) And the thing is, is I even call them seasoned. But you think about the classics and the ones that are techies, and I love the, the I, I was trying to figure out what picture can I put there. Any Fast and Furious fans here? Uh, don't tell me you don't watch movies, right? Because, you know, I, I remember, I, I still tease so that you know, and those of you that are watching. I still tease my church because so that you'll know, I took over, I was privileged to take over in 2002. And I know that our church is rich, rich in legalism. And I mean that. I mean, you talk about the book of Galatians. I mean, they were entrenched in it. And I, to this day, I poke fun at some of those that were raised in that type of lifestyle because, you know, again, I mean, it's not a bad thing. Wesleyan teaching and holiness and all that, it's not, it was good for the era. But I still struggle to ask them. What was the spiritual significance of not going bowling? I, I, know, I, just, you know, I just wanted to know this because, you know, again, I, I poke fun at them because I know that a lot of them need a spiritual hug because they were abused. You know, I mean, I'm thinking, okay, look, I'm putting my hand there because this is how you bowl, right? You put your hand there, right? right? And then you, 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 you got your bowl, and, and I'm thinking, okay, what is the spiritual significance? You got your pins there, and you 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 get your and you you you're gonna throw your ball, right? I'm thinking, okay, you have your bowling ball. You know it has a nice break to it, and as you break it, it goes in, and it should just strike, right? Of course, it's not always a strike for me, but let's just say that, right? I'm still trying to figure out what is the spiritual significance of not going bowling, and there was a lot of things, and I poked fun a lot of things that, that were their teachings. And I understand that there was a certain awareness, if you will, that they they wouldn't partake in. But I was reminding them that our Jesus, our Jesus, he always, I mean, with sinners. And people pointed fingers at my Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not telling you to go out of your way. But the thing is, is Jesus was a friend of sinners of which I, just like the Apostle Paul, am one of them. But by the grace of God, so I think about the the classics and the techies bringing people together. And I'm reminding this church, if I were to ask you right now, and I'm not going to ask you to do that, because a lot of you were raised in the church. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. But many of us, when I think about it's all about God, And we know it's about God's grace. And God says in verse 14 that he put his spirit in you because you were nothing but bones. You were dry. You had nothing to your name. And God was literally placing things, building this nation up like he's building this church up. And God reminds us that let's say we were to get post-its. You know what post-its are, right? 
let's say we were to get post-its, and I were to tell you to put down on this post-it one thing that God brought you out of, a sin, something you're struggling with. And then we're going to sing a song, and we're all going to greet each other. And everybody's going to get to see what you've come through. We would be a better community because everybody would see what you struggled with or who you really are. It almost reminds me of when I went to Honolulu. They had this thing called cardboard testimonies. And everyone got an opportunity to get a piece of cardboard, and they placed this cardboard in front of them, and it says, I was once a heroin addict. And they would flip it and then say, but God redeemed me by the blood of the lamb. If each one of us had a post-it to place on our foreheads and walked around, and I looked at every one of you and said, that's what you struggled with. That's how God redeemed you. That's how God brought you out of the miry clay. That's how God put you on solid ground. We would be a better church because of it, because it's all about God. We all have... We all have our shortcomings, but by the grace of God, we could all look back, and those are, those are our individual testimonies, but we could always look back on those to remind us that being part of New Life Christian Fellowship, it doesn't matter what economic background you are, what ethnicity you are, it doesn't matter what generation you're from, it's all about God, and we could put away those little peripheral things and understand when we have our priorities set because it's all about God, we could serve God here in this church and let God be God. Amen? Amen. I'm moving along. Because Jesus Christ says this in John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's here in this church. This is the priority and this is the focus, understanding that it is the life that we have in Christ Jesus. I'm going to end with this, church. I know that many of you are saying, Pastor Ben, there are things in my life I can't share with this church. In fact, thinking about that post-it placed on my head, that is something I would be afraid or ashamed to, to show you with because in most churches, we have hurting people. Let me say that again. In most of our churches, we have hurting people. We come to church every Sunday and sometimes mid-Sundays, and sometimes Bible study groups or life groups, and we never know what people are going through because they always come to these events with a mask on. They don't always tell us what's going on in their lives. And God is reminding us through the prophet Isaiah, he says in verse chapter 40, verse 31, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. Amen? So the prophet is telling us that, sure, you go through difficult times. And sure, as a church, you will go through difficult times. And sometimes the hope that you have in Jesus may seem so distant. And sometimes you'll be wondering, where is God when we're going through these difficult times and I want to share this wonderful story that I've shared countless times. I don't know if I've ever shared it here, but it's a reminder to us. The story goes like this, because it kind of deals with hope. It says, there was a farmer who owned an old mule. One day, the old mule fell into a deep well and could be heard yelping, he was screaming for help. The farmer, unable to free the mule, decided he would just put the mule out of his misery and bury him. He drove his backhoe and began to dump a pile of dirt on top of the mule, but each time the pile of dirt would hit the mule, the mule would shake the dirt from himself and stand up on the pile. This continued over and over again. The pile of dirt would fall and hit the mule. He would shake the dirt from, uh, from his body and stand. The, the mule was hit, he would shake the dirt from his body, and he would stand until the hole was filled to the very top, and the mule, seeing that he was at the top of the hole, jumped out to his freedom. 
when things go a little awry in your life and it just seems like there's no hope, church, I know. I know that God is a God that allows some of the shaking, just like this mule, to go on in our lives. But your heavenly perspective should always remind you, when I get hit with a pile of dirt, I'm going to shake it off, stand up on top of the foundation that I'm, I'm founded on, and stand. Each time this happens, and you've started your, you finished your 25 years, the next 25 may be just as hard, and as long as you're in God's favor, the dirt's going to hit you, shake the dirt from you. Turn to your neighbor and shake the dirt from you. You guys don't believe that. Because I'm here to tell you, the next 25 years, pastor's going to lead you. You're going to go through some times in your life. But every time you feel that trial, shake the dirt from you. Stand up on the foundation that you're founded in Christ Jesus and raise your head up. Amen? Amen. Persevere as a church because that's what we're all about. When things start rattling, God happens. Amen? Amen? It's a we thing. It's about church. You know, I know it's all about Jesus, but God has put the church because he is the head of the church and you, you are the body. Amen? Amen? And lastly, as long as your ducks are in a row, as long as your priorities are set, it's always going to be about God no matter who comes into the fellowship. Yeah, right. Learning to work together and lift Jesus higher. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you for New Life Christian Fellowship.